Well, good uh, morning, everyone. And we are glad that uh, you're able to join us for our Sabbath school today. This is the 10th lesson of this study as we talk about the new covenant. And with me to study this uh, awesome lesson, we have some friends from our church. And on the screen, you will see uh, Kent Bon McFarlane, who has been on a couple of our lessons. Uh, Kent Bon, you want to say hi? Hi, everybody. Appreciate the, this lesson. And, uh, you know, we look forward to uh, the audience participating as well. Awesome. Thanks, Kent. And then also we have uh, Lester Horrell. Uh, Lester, do you want to say hi? Hi, everybody. Good, yeah. good to be here and to discuss this lesson with some bright people. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lester. We, we pray that God's wisdom will come through, right? Amen. Amen. <laughs> yes. And also we have uh, Roger Harrison. Roger, you want to say hi? Pleasure to be here. Welcome, friends. We'll have a good study today. Amen, amen. And we have a new friend who's joining us today, and that's Brooke Ramsey. Brooke, you want to say hi? Hi, guys. Hello. Thanks again. It's nice to be here together. We, we thank God for the opportunity to study his word together. So uh, once again, it's good for those of us who are watching uh, to begin with prayer. So I'm just going to invite uh, Roger, if you can, just to give us an opening prayer. Will that be all right? Absolutely. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much for the certainty of your word and for all your promises and this covenant relationship we have with you. We invite your presence as we explore your word, guide our thoughts and our tongues for Christ's name's sake. Amen. 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 Thank you. So let's dive into it. So uh, the lesson for today is the new covenant. We're going to try and process this in four main segments. And uh, the key text that we're working from is out of Jeremiah. So I don't know if Brooke, you might be able to help us out just to read out Jeremiah 31. And we are going to focus on verse 31 through 34. So that's Jeremiah 31 from verse 31 through 34. Brooke, if you can, let's go for it. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Sure, keep on going up to 34. Oh, sorry. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, say, know the Lord, for they all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. All right. Thanks, Brooke. So you captured well verse 31, which talks about, you know, God will make a new covenant. And we come across this word in the Old Testament there, because uh, this is Jeremiah in the Old Testament. And at the very uh, last verse in verse 34, it talks about how uh, God intends for this covenant to be. Uh, but then there are also two verses in between, 32 and 33. Um, um, Lester, are you in a position to just do for us verse 32 and 33 of Jeremiah 31, if you can? Okay. Could I read from another version? Sure. Go for it. Okay. This is the New Living Testament. And it says, the covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant. Though I love them as a husband loves his wife, says the Lord. But this is a new covenant I will make with the people of Israel on that day, says the Lord. I will put my instructions deep within them and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Amen. I like that translation. It says this where God puts it, it will not be on the surface. I'm going to put it deep. <laughs> yeah, I like it. I like it. So um, I think there are four main things that we can see out of that covenant <clears throat> that God is presenting there for us. I don't know if anyone wants to talk a little bit about, are you sensing like four key areas that God is stating will be a part of this covenant. Um, he calls it the new covenant. You can see in verse uh, verse 33 that he's going to put his instructions deep in their hearts, right? That's one thing we know he's going to do. Anything else that you see God saying he's going to do out of verse 33? Yeah. 
He's going to forgive their sins. So he's going to forgive their sins. That's something God promises to do. So he, he promises to put his instructions or his laws in their mind and in their hearts. And then he promises to forgive their sins. And then there are two more things we can pick up right there. Uh, you, you'll see when he says that he'll be their God and they'll be his people, right? Right. And then also the sense that they shall all know him. They will right. not be told um, um, who is this God. They will know who he is. So, so based on what we are seeing here, uh, Kent, one, I don't know what, your, what is your thought. Who do, who do you see then as the initiator of this new covenant? Who do you see as the one initiating the covenant? Well, God is the one that's initiated the covenant. Amen. He's, he's, he's the one who initiated the covenant. So that would be the answer. Um, I like the four that you, four point that you give. Uh, I think uh, you can translate those four points into four points, which uh, the first one, I will write my laws in their heart, uh, would be like sanctification. He's, that's really what it is, uh, sanctification. And the second one, I will be their God, they will be my people, is, uh, is really a reconciliation uh, being illustrated there. Third one, everyone will know me. No one need, uh, need uh, people to know me. That's talking about revelation and mission, right? And then the last one, I will forgive their sins, would be justification. Correct. So those four points, those four things are in all the covenant which make you understand that this is an everlasting covenant because it hasn't changed. Correct, correct. Thanks, Ken. So we see God as the one who is initiating mm. all. Uh, Roger, here we, we have a sense that the law is written. Um, what's your take? Wh whose law do you think is being written? And if you're to think about law, which, which law do you think this is all about? <laughs> and I think I don't want to get too far ahead of the lesson and bring us all the way down to where we get in Thursday. Um, but there, the, the law is singular. And the law is the, 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 the law of the God of the universe. Uh, and God is, say, God is saying, I'm going to write my law, but not the law uh, contained in all of the ordinances. Do this and do that and do this and do that and do that. Uh, it's the law that says, um, um, I, I, I like the, the imagery of the husband. It's the law of love. It's the law that says we are going to be in a relationship with each, each other. Um, and it's the kind of love relationship that, that keeps me looking out for you and you looking to me. That's the law. Love, love the Lord your God with all of our hearts and all of our minds and all of our souls. Right. Amen. Amen. And, and I, think, uh, I think that's a good point. Uh, I don't know if, Brooke, you're getting something out of that about the relationship. Uh, do you see God emphasizing relationship in the way he is presenting the law? What's your take on it, Brooke? So how I see it is um, the people before this didn't do so well of keeping it themselves. So he's going to help us with writing it in our hearts and our minds. Huh. And he wants to be there with us to go yeah. through it and um, it's through him, it's not through us. We can't do anything to be saved, it's through him. Man, um, it's, it's a good point because uh, you, you bring it out well and I think this lesson will help us to talk a little bit more about it. Uh, if it's dependent upon our power to keep it going, we'll have the same problem that they did. We're just not strong enough to do that. But we, we need to depend on him, uh, that act of relationship, a dependence on God. And even as Roger added, it's, it's based on love because he's using the idea of husband and wife, kind of being the context of working that through. Uh, so, so Lester, I'm curious, you know, because it's being called a new covenant. Uh, from what you can gather, why is a new covenant necessary? What's your thought on this? Why is the idea of a new covenant necessary? Well, if there, was, if there is a new covenant, it presupposes that there was an old one. Correct. And I'm sure that we um, talked about the old one in previous lessons, but just to reiterate that there was an old covenant, which God made with the children of Israel, which the Bible later on says was imperfect. Uh -huh. And there were several reasons for that. One is that 
God likes to talk directly to his people. And God doesn't like to speak to an intermediary. And remember when he made the covenant under the train of Israel, and he said, when Moses came to them, the train of Israel spoke to Moses and they said, all that the Lord said we would do. And then later on, they said, we don't want to speak to God. You speak to God for us. How would you like as a parent to speak to your children through an intermediary? <laughs> it's, it's, it's not the ideal situation. So, um, yeah, so God, there was the intermediary Moses and God wasn't speaking, this is my take on it, directly to the people. So that's one of the ways it was imperfect. And I'm sure, I, as Roger said, I don't want to go, get ahead of the lesson because we're going to compare the old and the new. But um, yeah, so there was an old covenant, but the old covenant had to make way for the new because the, the children of Israel were obeying, trying to obey the law, right? And we talked about the husband wife relationship. They did not have that love relationship with God. They were trying to get the love, to win the love of God by obeying the law. And they, they had it upside down. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And, and I think when we go into that same route, we find difficulties because it's not possible for us to actually uh, obey it by ourselves, you know. Um, if I, go ahead. If I just add a thought. I, I remember we had some really dear friends before we moved to Delaware. They lived in Utah. And on their 50th wedding anniversary, they, they decided to throw another wedding. And so the bride got into her bridal dress. She got a new one maybe. And the groom got into his tux. And I remember like watching him, like just looking so nervous as he was walking down the aisle to his bride. And it wasn't a new bride. It was a renewing of the thing that had been in place. Right. Uh, and, 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 and so the new covenant is really the parties are the same parties. But what we're doing is recognizing in this case in the scripture that we we made some vows and one of us was not faithful to those vows. The new covenant is now the party who happens to be the party who remained faithful saying, you know what, why don't we renew those vows? Uh, but this time we're going to do it so that we'll be closer. Right, right. Awesome. And I think that's a good point because... Uh, even as we read, it talked about how um, the people broke uh, my covenant. God says, my people broke. They broke my covenant. Uh, Kent, were you adding something to it? Well, I, I'll try. Um, <clears throat> one of the, what, what Roger said make a lot of sense because, um, and, and of course it was uh, listed, it mentioned that also, is that in a marriage, things change. You know, it starts out good, it went downstairs, it's come up back stairs, it's continued like that. So it's never one of those steady relationships that is always good. I always thought that uh, my uncle and aunt, one of them, you know, remind me that that may not be true in all cases, that, that because their marriage was so good. Um, so we see in the Old Testament and the New Testament where the everlasting covenant is being represented in different times and events. Almost like God is saying, well, you messed it up, let's start again. You messed it up, let's start again. You know, let's start again, let's start again. So we see that same flavor of the marriage, you know, the, the, the essence of a marriage that is not always going straight and good, but the, 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 the party that is faithful always want to renew it, you know, and keep it going. Right. So that's really very well illustrated in all these different times the covenant has been so-called renewed because it is one of the lasting covenant, but it's been renewed over and over as, as, as phases. Correct. Uh, so the concept of renewal, I think, is, is there. And I actually even like the story given at the beginning of the lesson you know, from the platoon whereby the, the guy says that the, the new thing about this, did you see the word new? That is what is new because it's really a renewal, you know. Just, just that number in the box. It's not quite, it's not, it's not manufactured new, but it's just labeled. It's labeled, right? 
Uh, so let's then talk a little bit about this. There are probably some, some differences and I don't mind us going ahead and yeah. just delving into this right now. There are probably some differences. And as Lester, you had alluded, you think about the old covenant and the new covenant. There are probably some things which are different and a number of things that are similar. So how about we begin with similarities? Uh, if you look at the covenants, the old and the new, let's talk about it. I don't know who wants to take it on. Um, what are some of the similarities that you see all through the old and the new covenant? Anyone who wants to take a stab at that, what are some of the similarities you see in this covenant? Well, I may, I may try one. Okay. One is that love is the essence of the covenant. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe another one would be forgiveness is a continuous part of the covenant that's similar in all the refer the the, uh, the covenant phases. Correct. So the, the and, and requirement of obedience and faith. Those are those are things that are in in the covenant in all of them. Right. I was going to add, just at a very foundational level, the parties have not changed. Right. So one similarity between the old and the covenant is it's still the same parties. <laughs> yeah, in, in the sense, and I think Roger, in the sense of divinity and humanity. Yeah. yeah. We we can talk about how the players might seem to be dying and other new players coming to the scenery, but it's the same humanity that we're dealing with. Uh, Lester, did I see you wanting to add something to it? Both of them are based on a relationship, and we talked about that, um, between God and his people. Right. Um, both of them are based on, on grace, as right. we see. Because in the Old Testament, if you remember the Ten Commandments, the first verse of Exodus 20 says, I'm the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. That is the grace that God afforded them. He, he brought them out of the land of Egypt. They didn't deserve that. And God freed them from slavery. He freed them from oppression. And when God stated that I'm the Lord thy God, which brought thee out, then he, then he starts enunciating the principles of the law. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not do this and not do that. But it's because I offered you that grace, right? It's the same with the new covenant. It's based on grace, but we see, always see that the grace comes first. Right. And the relationship and obedience follows naturally after that. Right. Thank you, Lester. Uh, Brooke, anything you want to add to it? <laughs> what I was going to say is they both point to Jesus. I mean, the temple, the, the showbread, the candlesticks, all that thing, they were showing, like mm -hmm. providing the way to see Jesus when he came. Right. And he came and then when he was on earth, he was actually showing us how to live and what God was like. So they're just both point to Jesus as well and his character. Correct, correct. Because yeah, it's it's all based on Jesus. Uh, we, we can never make a claim that uh, others were saved with any other way of salvation other than Christ himself. Um, so if you're going to talk about um, the differences, uh, is there anything that you see as different from the old covenant and the new covenant? Or is the Lord a master of branding? What, what do you guys think? <laughs> Well, you could say, um, uh, Pastor, that uh, the most, the most um, obvious one is that one is written on stone and the other is going to be written in the heart. Uh, so that's one big one. The other one, I think that is not so clear, but it's there. It's that one is ratified by the blood of animals, but the new one, the old is ratified by the blood of animals, the new one ratified by the blood of Jesus. So those are two major ones in terms of differences. So uh, maybe some other people might want to add some more out of this. Yeah, there is actually something I want to think about there, Kent, and maybe as uh, the other friends think about it. Um, there was definitely the writing on stone, right? Mm -hmm. But 
Is it possible that actually even the old covenant included writing in the heart? Because uh, uh, I'm getting a sense that um, reading through Deuteronomy, there were actually two references that brought this fully to my mind in, in Deuteronomy 6 that, and verse 5 and 6, that, that God speaking through Moses is saying, we want you to put this in the heart. I don't know if we can maybe have someone who might be willing to read that for us. Deuteronomy uh, 6 and verse, uh, verse 5 and 6. I'm there so I can read it if that's fine. Yes. Deuteronomy 6, 5 and 6. It says this. Do you want me to do um, 4 or just 5 and 6? You can do 4, 5 and 6. That should be fine. I'm going to go ahead and include 4 if that's okay. Go for it. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. Ah, so, so we, we, are, we are hearing something, by the way, that Jesus repeated in the New Testament. But then we are hearing an emphasis that Moses is saying, these words I command you today shall be in your heart. So the, um, I, I don't think Moses is trying to remind them about all the, um, the system of sacrifices. That's not his point. Is really the centrality of the love of God and how we need to give ourselves to him and even our love for each other. He says this, there's something about our heart that has to be transformed. Roger, I see you want to say something. Go for it. Well, I, I'm looking at Deuteronomy and then Lester made the comment about the law that's written in stone. And I'm just thinking about God's love and human stubbornness this way. You know, it sh you don't, that shall not kill, that shall not steal, that shall not bear false witness. Um, how many of us are going to be saved based on the things that we did not do? How many of us will achieve salvation because we'll be able to say, well, I, didn't... I did not kill and I did not steal and I, di I didn't lie and I didn't commit adultery. How many of us will have our salvation based on the things that we did not do? Um, sounds like zero, it seems. The answer to me, because here, because the, the key of the commandments wasn't about don't do this and don't do that. It was about what we just read here, which is be, loving the Lord with everything that I have causes a change in me. Um, and I think they were written that way simply because of the stubbornness and the loyalness of the people um, who like, what do you mean, love you? And it's like, well, People who love me, this is how they operate in the world. And so the, the covenant to me did not change. I think what God is making central, how it's about the heart relationship. So. Amen. Amen. That's why God was saying they had a heart of stone. Right. Because stone <laughs> don't receive love. Right. Yeah, and that's I, why he wanted to replace it with a heart of flesh, right. which could receive his love and which could receive his words and act on it. You know, it's good that you said that uh, because I was just thinking that that although we see that text in Deuteronomy, the reason why the Lord says he's going to write it on your heart is that uh, it, the heart is a heart of stone and they were rejecting being written on their heart because they were looking to the stone commandment rather than what Deuteronomy said it should be in your heart. But now we see that the Lord said, well, I'm, I'm going to change all this. I'm not going to make you look at the stone commandment anymore. I'm going to put it in your heart. And before I do that, I'm going to give you a heart of flesh. Now, I, I mean, I'm sure theologians have a, a lot of information about how they would look at that. But for me, the way I see it is that he's saying, I will enable you to keep the law through the grace that I will give you. You know, my grace is sufficient for you, kind of what Jesus said. So here God is saying, I want to change things. I'm not changing the requirement of the covenant, but I'm going to change in part of the process in the covenant. Right. I'm, going to, I'm going to think of you as, um, you know, wanting to do it. So I'm going to give you the, enable you to do it because by yourself, you can't do it. Right, right. And you know, I think it's fascinating, honestly, 
the Lord who wrote fast the law on stone, although he knows that our heart are hearts of stone, he does not just write it on our stony hearts. He wants to change it first. He says, it's not like I have a problem writing on stone. All I want to tell you is that if your heart continues being a heart of stone, you won't be able to work with me. So let me change your heart into a heart of flesh. And let's see if you can be able to appreciate more what it is. So, but let's address this question before we jump into the next segment, which is, you think about it. There are friends who don't believe that um, under the new covenant, there is any aspect of law. Um, how, how do we respond to this in a way that does not emphasize legalism, but at the same time does not do away with the centrality of what God's law is in our lives? Uh, I don't know who wants to take a stab at this. Uh, how do we respond to friends saying, no, we no longer have to keep any commandments? It's interesting, again, when we think about the, and I, I want other panelists to think, but if we just take that, 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 that moral law, if we just take the Ten Commandments and we start going through them and say, because of this new commandment, what is now permissible that under the old covenant was not permissible? Am I now allowed to kill, steal, adulter, lie? in court, um, covet. And because I, I think uh, there, there are two commandments that really, really um, get to people who believe that we're no longer under law. One is have no other gods before me because I need to be able to pursue my own economic ends and have mammon be greater than God. And remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Uh, I think eight other commandments seem to make sense, even for people who say we're no longer under law. But really, I can't be as great as God and maybe slightly greater. And do I have to do the whole remember the Sabbath day thing? Because right. I don't really get a lot of people engaging in fierce debate uh, that because the we're under a new covenant, killing is now permissible. Uh -huh. <laughs> right, right. I, 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 I think you're definitely can see that the law is part of the covenant. Uh, although if you, if somebody would read uh, Romans 6, looking at 11 through 14, uh, it talks about that where Paul is talking about the law and grace. And what we see is that, uh, would somebody read that for me? Uh, Romans 6, 11 to 14. Anyone want to volunteer that? I will. <clears throat> 11 to 14. Uh -huh. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead in, indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lust and do not present your members as instruments of righteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall have no dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. So, so this uh, phrase, I'm not under law, but under grace, is often used as a, as a dismissal for, you know, people who are saying Sabbath keepers in particular having a conversation with uh, others. They say, well, you know, you guys believe you should keep the commandments, but we're not under law, we're under grace. But when we look at this and we look at the covenant, we see that the covenant really include the law because if you have a covenant and you have a ratification of the covenant is ratified based on principles it has to have some principle that it's ratified on the law is the principles on which it's it's ratified on often though when we look at the law we we see more of a negative context in the law but but really if you really look at it carefully the law is really talking about character building it's talking about you building your character after God's character because the law is a transcript of his character. And even the covenant, you know, which is considered an everlasting covenant, uh, is talking about based on God's character, God himself, God is his own loving character, his own char character. So uh, 
um, here we come again to the idea that we know the law has to be part of any kind of agreement that you have. It has to be based on some kind of law. Not that you're a legalist, because we know the law doesn't save you, neither does obedience save you, but it is Christ's gift that saves you. But it, I would say that the law, keeping those an, is an outgrowth of the faith you have in God and the love you have based on that faith. And God is not asking you to love him just because you're, he's going to punish you. He's saying uh, you, you love him because in your heart is love. You have become like him in that you love, and you're, it's loving obedience that he wants. Right. So it, it, it comes to, once you use the word obedience, you're talking about what do you obey? And the only thing that we see in the covenant, um, any of the covenant, even because even when it's referred to Abraham, it was said of Abraham, he will keep my laws and statutes. Right? So it's always referring to the law as being the principle on which it is based. Right. But it's also quite sure that you, by your sin, the sinful nature, cannot keep that law. Correct. Right. Okay. I'm, I'm glad Ken mm -hmm. brought up the concepts of law and grace because. Our friends believe in salvation by grace through faith. And I, I saw this little quotation here, and I'd like to point that out to you. Right. It says the law of God is the what, but the grace of God is the how. Mm. Um, the law of God indicates man's problem, but the grace of God provides God's remedy mm. for that problem. The law of God is the standard. The grace of God is the means to that standard. The law of God tells us of the character of God and the grace of God reproduces that character in us. And the law of God is the effect God wants to see and the grace of God is the cause that brings forth that effect. Amen. That's a Paul. Yeah. Much appreciated. I love that. Uh, Brooke, I saw your hand too. <clears throat> what I would first tell them is that I keep the Ten Commandments not to be saved, but because I am saved. Mm -hmm. um, just like if you would get married or a friendship or anything, there's vows you keep, there's things you keep, not because you're made to, but because you love them. And God loves us. He loved us first. So why wouldn't I want to give that back to him. It's just the bare minimum. It, there's more than being saved than just the 10 commandments. And then also that's another study on its own <laughs> of why it was inside the ark, not outside the ark. But um, that's what I would say. <laughs> Thanks Bruce. much appreciated. Uh, you know, uh, and before I shift gears into talking about the changing of our heart here, um, I, I think there are two aspects I just want to add on and then we go to uh, changing of heart, uh, which is going back to something Roger pointed out, when you look at many of uh, the eight other commandments, there's a way that someone can rationalize and say, I see why this makes sense. But when you deal with the idea of don't have any other gods and the idea of remember the Sabbath, these are things you have to approach them by faith because logically they will not make sense so you embrace them by faith and trust God for it and and, and then also you recognize that sometimes our view of the law may depend on where we are in life because if we see the law as that which just minimizes crime around us that's one way to look at it and usually when we are introduced to the law we can see it as something that helps us not to have crime uh, for me not to be hurt and for me not to hide the other person, that can be the bare minimum. But the more you get exposed to God's law, you realize, by the way, it's making me aware of some problems I have in me. And I think, as uh, Lester, you pointed out, yeah, the law may point out a problem, but the grace will point out the solution or the right. meaning right. of solving the problem. And so we come to a place where after, that is where the law is a tutor for us. But then later on, as you become one with Christ, uh, keeping the law is not something you struggle with because now Christ is living his life. Mm -hmm. I, I like the way you said it, you know, the law shows us God's character. Grace helps to produce that character in us. Right. 
So we live that life as we go on. And so we can trust God for his goodness. So how does this change of heart really happen? Because there are two things here I think we want to talk about too. We see Jeremiah, if we're going to walk with the context, Jeremiah is writing just before the nation of Judah is going into captivity. And there's a promise of a new covenant. But then Hosea is also another prophet who writes at a time when the northern kingdom is about to go into captivity too. And God, through Hosea, speaks of a covenant as well. So I don't know if we can get a volunteer to help us read this one. Um, uh, Let's say you look ready to go for it. Are you ready to go for Hosea? Hosea chapter 2. Okay. I I, I could read it. Hosea what chapter? Hosea 2, chapter 2, verse 16 through 20. Okay. Hosea chapter 2, verse 16 to 20. Yeah, and, and as Lester finds it, I don't know if, Roger, you, you, you have a brief way to summarize Hosea's story for someone who's watching and is trying to figure out what is this Hosea narrative all about? Is there a brief version you can give? Like, an- uh, I mean, I can give you a brief version, but the brief version might not sound, um, you know, some parents might want to hide their children, but just imagine, just imagine waking up one day and... Um, <laughs> and having someone says, I want you to go down to that Route 40 strip, for those of you who are familiar with Newcastle, and there's going to be a woman out there. She's been working all night right. um, because this is how she <laughs> generates her income. Uh, and I want you to take that woman, marry her, make her your wife, bring her home. <laughs> yes. her on, the, on the Route 40 strip. And that, in essence, is what's happening here with uh, Hosea. Yes. And just think of how many people would be like, what you mean? Yeah, she's been out there working all night. Take her home and marry her. Yeah. Uh, it's a problem, that's right? A summary. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Roger, for the summary. You know, it's a good one. So, Lester, go for it now, if you don't mind. If you want to utter the summary, so, yeah. What's your chapter 2, verse 16? I'm reading from the New Living Testament. Yes. Hey, when that day comes, says the Lord, you will call me my husband instead of my master. O Israel, I will wipe the many names of Baal from your lips, and you will never mention them again. On that day, I will make a covenant with all the wild animals and the birds of the sky, and the animals that scurry along the ground, so they will not harm you. I will remove all weapons of war from the land, all swords and bows, so you can live unafraid in peace and safety. I will make you my wife forever, showing you righteousness and justice, unfailing love and compassion. I will be faithful to you and make you mine, and you will finally know me as the Lord. Is that up to 20? Amen, Amen. yes, thank you. That's up to 20. Kent, I don't know if you want to pick up on that or Lester, you want to add to it right away after you've read. Uh, there's an effort here that God is making um, towards these unfaithful people. What are, what are you seeing as God trying to do to win his unfaithful people? Well, you see, God is reaching out. He's always the first one to reach out. Right. And he's saying what he will do. Um, I will do this. I'll be a husband and not your master. And you'll be my wife. And he said, I will be faithful to you. Right? And I will, I will carry out the duties of a faithful husband. Okay. God is telling what he will do. I mean, the Israel didn't deserve that. Okay. Because they deserve to go into captivity. Right. But he will say, they, they will come in that day when I will redeem you. Yes. I will stop all the animals from hurting you. The birds of the field and all that will be singing the praises of our relationship. And I will do this for you. That's the grace. Uh-huh. Right? Yeah. And, and when I do this for you, that's when I will write my law in your hearts. Amen. And you have a heart of flesh. Right. Amen to that. Amen to that. Uh, can't you want to add to it? Well, just to say that um, at the time that he's doing this, which I agree with Lester, what he said, at the time he's doing this, as you mentioned, Israel, the 10 tribes, are being uh, captured. 
at the time that that um, this message uh, from uh, Jeremiah is coming out, and uh, mm -hmm. the yeah. the idea is that we see the same theme that we talked about in the marriage relationship that God has not given up at any time in the history of this covenant. He's you know even when he had to destroy the nation under Noah, he didn't give up. He said, "I'd save eight people so that they can continue with this relationship." But the covenant, this is the thing I think that impresses me most about seeing how God is continuously trying to explain the covenant a little bit more, what he means, and also he's not giving up on the people. And when it comes to now the new covenant, we see he illustrates, or rather he explains the covenant even more by the illustration of the life of Christ. And then he continued to preach now the gospel, which is, a, is the same appeal. You know, he continued to appeal to the people. He explains, he, he appeal, he explains the appeal, trying to get their attention in just about every segment, every, about every phase of the human development since sin. Yeah. It, it's really, it's really something passionate. You just, if you begin to look at it, look at all the time you hear him calling them again, and again, and explaining more, and explain almost pleading to us as humanity to uh, participate with Him in this plan of restoration, the plan of salvation. I think even if you look at the commandments themselves and why they start that way, why didn't He start with "Thou shalt not kill"? Why was that not the first commandment? It seems like it would save a lot of life, right? Yeah. <laughs> it starts with no other gods don't have other gods before me and so as we look at the the story here um we're looking at hosea and what lester is and like i said for people who who say we're under a new covenant uh we're not the first thing that god says is um it says when he says i'm a jealous god what he's saying it it, it uh i interpret that as it literally hurts my heart to see you seeking other relationships because the other relationships can't provide you what you need That's the other relationships that you seek are going to end with your destruction and when i say i'm jealous i don't mean that i'm a stalker i don't mean that i want to be in a toxic unhealthy relationship with you what i'm saying is it hurts my heart to see you wander away from me because i'm your everything and so that's why the first commandment um, and that's in, in, the, in the context of just thinking about God's like, really, it's a desperate love for us. Yeah. Uh, that the idea that the that law would be moot doesn't make sense in light of God's character. Correct. And you know, the, uh, something here that I think we want to add, and then maybe, Brooke, I don't know if you may be able to help us uh, just read uh, for us out of uh, Psalm 51, verse 10 through 12. Uh, one thing I want to bring out is, when you look at the covenant relationship and the covenant language in scripture, God seems to use certain relationship context to help us understand this relationship. So there are times when he presents himself as a father and we are his children. There are times he presents himself as a master and we are his servants. There are actually times Jesus uses this language two times where at one point he presents himself as a friend. He says, I no longer call you servants, I call you friends. Right. You have been upgraded you know, in a way, right? And then there's a sense in which he calls us a brother. But then it's as though out of that journey, out of the book of Hosea, God says, I am going to bring you into a much deeper and more intimate relationship and say, you're no longer going to be considered consider me master and you servant, you're going to be my wife, I'll be your husband. It's like there's a progression in how God is bringing us into this relational aspect. He says the more we get to know him, the more intimate this relationship becomes with him. And to be able to get to that place is like we can do it by ourselves. So Brooke, help us out, uh, Psalm 51, uh, 10 through 12. Let's see what it says. Create in me a clean heart, O God and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. 
Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Man, so the prayer is for God to do something, right? God is the one creating. I think I go back to something less to say. God initiates the process. And part of this initiating the process is recognizing our hearts cannot change themselves. And we actually need to be changed. And God is the one who changes us. What I'm picking up out of this is that rather than changing the law, God sees the change needs to be in our hearts, that our hearts are the ones in need of changing rather than uh, God's law changing. Um, so is, is, it, is it fair to say that naturally our desires of our human heart can be weird and wicked? Is that, is that a fair statement as human beings to say, our heart's desires can be very deceptive. And, and in the light of that, if you will agree with me, I, I want to invite your discussion with this one last text before we move to the next segment, which is out of Psalm 37 verse four. I don't know if Kent Bonny want to read that for us. And then maybe let's, let's, how do we, if we know that our heart's desires are wicked, how do we understand then Psalm 37 verse four? I don't know what your take will be on that. Okay. Psalm 37, verse 4. Oh. 37, verse yes. 4. Verse 4. So if we know our hearts are wicked, how, how do we explain Psalm 37? 37, verse 4 says, uh, Delight thy yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Yeah. So I'm curious. Uh, what do you think? <laughs> uh, yeah. The you know the idea is that um, the way the way the Bible talk about oh you get to be like Christ is that beholding you become changed, which really speaks of prayer and Bible study to become changed because it's not your changing, but you're exposing yourself to the process of getting changed when you do that. As you behold, you become changed. I think, you know, there's, you know, I like this, this text you just said, um, it says also, if you continue at five, if I, you don't mind, I might continue reading five. It says, commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. He mm -hmm. shall bring it to pass, but you're trusting in him. So again, in this relationship with God, it is not you doing the work, but you're, the work for you is to trust and depend and have faith. And as you are praying all the time, you put yourself in the environment to be changed. So that's the, you know, the environment. I believe David understood it very well in, I think is uh, Psalm 14, let me see if I'm right. Psalm 14, verse eight, I think. David says, um, let me see, making sure. Psalm 14, verse 8. Can you read that for me, uh, Elvis? See, While Psalm I look of, at a little background here. Psalm 14, verse 8. Psalm 14, verse 8. Uh -huh. I'm there. It says, okay. I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is within my heart. Right. I think in some of the versions it says, your law is written on my, on my heart. So it seems like David got the point. David says, the law being written in my heart make me delight to do it. You know, it's not a struggle, as you said earlier, Pastor, that it's not a struggle for David or for you and me to keep the law because the enabling of it, as we say, we look at verse, the one we just read, verse uh, thir chapter 37. Uh, it, I mean, uh, God is saying, I am doing the work. You don't have to worry about how difficult it is or what or how it happened. All you have to do is to stay near me, right? And fill up the that gap that you have to study the word, meaning know more about me, know, learn more about me, and come to me with your problems. And as long as this connection is, I will do the changing. Amen. And, and I, I like that, that David, David saying, 
your law is written in my heart and I delight to do your will. Lester, go ahead. If we rewind a little bit and go back to the old covenant, we see the problem was not with God. The problem was not with the law. So what was the problem with? The problem was with the people, right? right? They failed. They failed to keep the provisions of, of the covenant. And it's the same thing with us in the new covenant. The problem is not with God. The problem is not with the law because, you know, God's law is immutable, just as God is immutable. God's law is holy, just as God is holy. God's law is permanent, just as God is always present. So the problem is with us and our acceptance of God, of the provisions God is offering us to put that heart within us, that fleshy heart. Yes. Right. And you know, I, I, I'm thinking that as we think of that text, will it be that really what David is pointing to is if we choose to delight ourselves and commit ourselves to God, he will actually create in us desires Amen. that we need to have. Amen. Because when God gives us his desires, we are not at war with his plan. We are actually desiring what he desires because we have entrusted ourselves to him. Exactly. And he creates in us th those desires that are actually a blessing. Right. Uh, now, uh, we, we've talked about this new covenant. We've talked about the idea of our hearts being changed. But then we also have a unique challenge here, which is this is covenant is being expressed to the people of Judah. And the you mean, you have you to do you're, is, you're saying it's not expressed to us? It's just well, that's, the, that's the question, because in the text, it talks about, God talks about what he's going to do to the people of Judah, or what God's promises to yeah, the yeah, people yeah, of Israel. Yeah. What yeah. happens to the rest of the saints? Well, uh, it has never been to one group of people. It started out being to everybody, and it continued to everyone. But in the case of the children of Israel, it was located in in, to them to distribute it and to explain it right that they, they that's was their job they it wasn't they were any special people in the sense that you know god preferred them over other people right. but they were given the responsibility to explain it which uh -huh. they failed of course because they they don't do, they didn't do that right. and i you know and, and coming back to one little thing you said earlier you said you were asking why why couldn't god just change the law and fit the circumstances. But how can you change your own character? Because the law is a, is a character of God. Right. That's why it is called the everlasting covenant, because it's based on the law, the character of God. Correct. Correct. So we, we have this situation where people are trying to come up with uh, justification for their behavior. And they would say, well, you know, the, the law is not anymore uh, a thing that we need to do because we're under grace, which uh, as, as uh, Lester explained, that doesn't make any sense because grace is enabling you to do the law. That's right. what grace is for because you can't do it by yourself. So let me, let me bring us back to discussing how can this affect everybody. Uh, uh, Roger, do you mind reading for us Isaiah 56 verse 6 to 7. Just share your thoughts on that too. And then Brooke, if you can, uh, Galatians 3 verse 7 through 9. And let's let's share our thoughts there to see what's God's idea for, for all people in these two contexts. So Roger, you'll have Isaiah 56, 6 through 7. And then Brooke, you can have Galatians 3, 7 through 9. Uh, just give us your thoughts on it and sure. see what God's idea is on this one. Sure. Go ahead. Uh, Isaiah 56, 6 and 7 says, Also the sons of the foreigner who joins themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord to be his servants, everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and hold fast my covenant, even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer, their burnt offices and their sacrifices their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. Awesome. Roger. And I think I can't explain it better than the word explained it because the word says 
it does not matter. Right. Um, uh, that foreigner, that person who's not like me, who's not from where I'm from, uh, God's saying, what I'm looking for, those who join themselves to the Lord. And that to me, again, uses that, that marital analogy, the two becoming one. He's like, I, I don't care who you are. What I care about is, are you in relationship with me? Because those are the people whose sacrifices and prayers I will accept. Awesome. Thanks, Raja. Brooke, are you ready to share from Galatians? Yeah. Go for it. Therefore, know that only those who are of faith of sons of Abraham and the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached a gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, in you all the nation shall be blessed. So then those who are faith, who are of faith are blessed by believing Abraham. Uh, any thoughts you want to add to that, Brooke? What do you think? You get a sense everybody's included or just the chosen few? Yes, yeah, so he was he wasn't just saying Abraham would have a lot of kids and they would be fruitful, but through his line, he would spread the word and Jesus would be born and all of that. Yeah. There's, there's a blessing there that God, actually, if you go back to Genesis 12, where God says that through you, all families of the earth will be blessed. Right. So God's intent was to walk through them to bless everybody else. And I think, I think Ken Boni had alluded to that earlier on in the study, that God's intent is to use this to bless everyone else. Uh, I don't know, Pastor, you have anything to add to that before we wrestle with one uh, final question for us here. Well, I say, you know, Pastor, before you, uh, before you turn off my mic and lock down my screen, yes, <laughs> and put it out there that it is possible that there are some Seventh Day Adventist believing Christians oh. who somehow have interpreted the word to me that salvation, the whole plan of God's salvation, yes. was created for Seventh Day Adventists. <laughs> And, yeah. and uh, heaven itself was just a, a neighborhood designed for Seventh Day Adventists. Right. Uh, and and sorry, <laughs> uh, that's it. Without recognizing that, like Israel, God saying, "I want to use you." Right. Yes. Amen. To I, share my message to the entire world. I, I uh, think that. But that, again, before my mic gets cut off, I I wonder if there's some. <laughs> you believe that heaven was just an exclusive neighborhood for well, seven if, if, if you're right then we have adopted the catholic doctrine <clears throat> so the the idea is that from the very beginning god is talking to all people and um i think that um as we come through this this last day we, we have we do have a special message uh for the last day message but again, you, we, to, we talk in terms of our responsibility, not our rights and privilege. Yes, we are honored. We are, we are honored by that responsibility. Yeah. To share his word. Yeah. And if you think about it, even that message we have been given is the everlasting covenant. Yeah. Uh, everlasting covenant. Same we convey that to all about this everlasting covenant rooted in Jesus himself. Uh, yeah. Take it out, we have no message to preach. As a matter of fact, I don't mind to continuously challenge every friend and say, if there's any gospel you preach or any doctrine you teach, and you have not found a way to understand it in light of the cross of Jesus, either it should not be taught, or number two, you don't get it yet. <laughs> because it will always bring us to the cross of Jesus who promised when I'm lifted up, I will draw all, not some. I will draw all to myself. And actually he say that in the context where some Greeks had come and they were looking for him and they couldn't get to him because he, wouldn't, he was in a segment of the temple that the Greeks could not go into. And right. Jesus said, my goodness, if I'm lifted up, I will draw all to me because he oh, will man. All, exactly. all to him. Yeah. So, uh, so, you, do, you, do you think that, may, my question, do you think that uh, maybe Adventists begin to feel exclusive like the Jews felt begin to feel exclusive mainly because of the reference to the sabbath so they use the sabbath to divide the world that sabbath keeping people you know as you say um uh, roger that sabbath keeping people are have exclusive rights to all these things that god promised 
Well, I just, and non-exclusive and non and non-Sabbath keeping don't. I just think of Jesus when when Jesus uh, at no point in his ministry did he make it about himself even. Right. Jesus was really clear. It's like I, I'm like I'm here to do the will of my Father. He sent me. Yeah. Uh, that's it. That's why. That's what I'm here for. And if if in the beginning, we understand the Godhead, but even even if the Son of God is saying. It's actually like what really matters is being reconciled with my father. Um, and when I lay my life down, I'll pick it up again and I'll be reunited with my father. But the reason I'm doing it is just so that all of us have the same opportunity that I have because I have the power. I mean, you can take this life, but I'm only going to be in the grave. I'm going to rest on Sabbath. I'm going to wake up again, but I want to make sure that everyone has the same opportunity to be reunited with my father. Amen to that. I remember when. Um... The disciples came to Jesus and they were condemning some other people who were casting out devils. And Jesus replied, you know, he who, he who is not against me is with me. So I don't believe we as a church has a monopoly on truth. Truth is found in Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Having said that, I want to come back to the new covenant. <laughs> I love the new covenant. I love the fact that it's all inclusive. I love the fact that I could be called a child of Abraham, yeah. who is the progenitor of faith. Right. I love the, the fact that Jesus is calling me, although I am not, I am a Gentile. I am not um, from Israel. I am not from, but I am from the Israel. I am called into Israel because Jesus has called me. Amen. I am happy for that. So I'm happy for the new covenant because the new covenant gives me that grace and gives me that hope in Jesus. Amen to that. Amen to that. And so, friends, let's let's focus now on the last segment here to finish. Um, I don't know, last I had thought to ask you to read for us uh, Hebrews eight verse six, if you can. And let's eight, six. Uh, Hebrews eight six. Let's begin to talk about this better promises uh what is better promises like how can we talk about that let's read first of all hebrews 8 verse 6 let's look at this together see what it means for us you see but now jesus our high priest has been given a ministry that is far superior to the old priesthood for he is the one who mediates for us a far better covenant with god based on better promises Right. So if someone were to challenge us to talk about how is this new covenant better than the old covenant? We have seen that, listen, there are many similarities, but here Paul gives us the idea, this covenant, the new covenant with through Christ, better covenant with better promises. What comes to mind? Uh, I'm curious what's your thought on this. I think we should go back to look at what we mean by ratifying the covenant. Mm -hmm. So if a covenant is ratified by the blood of animals, and then you come up with another covenant that is ratified by the blood of Jesus Christ, that's probably one of the first part of what he's saying, that this is a better covenant because it's a completely a complete covenant. Here the animal refers to Christ, and in the new covenant, Christ has, has done it. Christ uh, ratified the covenant. So it is a better covenant because it's a more completed covenant mm -hmm. in that sense. Right. So as part of the, the, the ratification through the blood of Christ, it's, it's right. now made legal, it's now uh, confirmed. That promise is made is now confirmed in Christ, and now we are able to see that in a better light because of, of Christ. It's not based on the blood of goats or bulls. So the blood makes it better in that sense, right? Yeah. Uh, any other thing that you think of that makes it better? I, I, I would think that uh, one of the other thing that I would say that makes it better is the representation of it. Okay. Uh, the old covenant is represented by the, the earthly sanctuary. Right. The uh, the priest 
the priesthood of that earthly sanctuary. The new covenant is represented by the heavenly sanctuary, which is the genuine, complete, the real sanctuary, so to speak. Right. Because the other one was a copy. Right. And because of that, that's a better covenant because it's, it, you know, here we see that uh, the, 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 the ratifier for our covenant is, is completely away from earth now, uh, is not under any, uh, any, any challenge by Satan at all. He's won the victory. Uh, he's on earth. He's, he's in heaven with the with the with the uh, with the heavenly cup with the heavenly sanctuary, and he's officiating in the heavenly sanctuary. So it's a that that also elevated it to a, a better sanctuary, right? A, a better a, be, a better covenant. So we can see that the mm -hmm. blood is better, the sanctuary is better. What do you think about the sacrifice itself? And what do you think about those who officiate in the sacrifice? I don't know if Lester or Roger or Brooke, you have any thoughts on that. Sure. And I think the lesson you know, highlights that really well uh, by pointing out the text. Just imagine, imagine, you know, if you and I were having a conversation, and I'm like, wow, look at this. I've got this giant brick of gold. It's about three feet tall, and it's sitting out here in the sun, and it's three o'clock, and I will split it with you. I will take the statue and you can have the shadow. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and it feels, like, it feels like a pretty even deal that I'm making with you. Um, you grab the shadow, I'll take the statue, and we'll both have something. Uh, <laughs> I think this is what the scripture is saying, like the, the sanctuary, the, the, the sacrifice, the priest, all of those things right. are shadows. All of those things are just a, like a, a, a fleeting representation of the, of the thing that we desire. And the thing that we desire was complete, complete forgiveness, salvation, and restoration. And, and so the new covenant, through that blood of Jesus Christ, makes it so that we don't have to grasp and grasp and grasp for shadows. Right. Man, don't grasp for shadows. I like no, that. Don't yeah, right. Um, yeah, I don't. So, go, go ahead, Dan. Brooke, uh, you want something, or Lester? Uh, was, Jesus, uh, say you know, Jesus is the center of it all. Because Roger talked about shadow. The, it's, it, it's described in the Old Testament as the, the sacrifices were shadow of things to come. Uh -huh. And that is Jesus himself. He's, he came in the flesh. Everything revolves around him. He is the one who makes the offer to us. And he is the one who ratifies it with his own blood. Right. So he has done so much. He made the offer. He ratified it. What, what do we do? We just have to accept it. Yeah. And now he's interceded in, in heaven. He's a high priest. Right. So he's, he's, he's the center of everything. Everything revolves around him. Mm -hmm. I think that's what makes it better. And, and, and think of it also one, one other little thing, which to think of it like a promise and an, the actual. So, so which is better, the promise or the actual? So the, the old was just a promise, just like Roger put it, the shadow. The new is the actual thing. So which would you prefer? The actual, for sure. Yeah, uh, of course, of course. <laughs> so I don't know if Brooke, you want to add something. I want to close with a challenge. Brooke, do you want to add something before I give the challenge? You know, I just used to always think if I was if I lived back then, I don't think I would have been saved, or I probably would have been disowned because I couldn't kill animals. So that's better. <laughs> yeah. you, 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 would, you wouldn't be one of the priests, right? <laughs> no. I hear you. Right. So, so I have a challenge for us. We we, we realize that. Um, in the, under the old covenant, the people struggled and they even tried when, you know, when, uh, when you read out of the book of Exodus, when Moses came down to the people and told them what God expected, they said, what the Lord said we will do. And they came up with their own idea of saying, we're, we're going to do what God wants. And then they failed. Um, is it possible to be in the new covenant but have an old covenant mindset. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and, and could that be maybe part of our struggle today as Seventh-day Adventists and even 
other religions and other faiths who begin to feel, I can do this. I just need enough runway. I'm going to take off. If you can just allow me enough time, I'm, I'm going to master this and do it. And, and I don't know if, if right now, if any friend who's listening, who is discouraged because they have tried and they don't sense they're able to do it, uh, I don't know if we have any closing thoughts to encourage uh, any friends on how to really embrace the new covenant and not be stuck in the old covenant mindset. Uh, I'll begin with Kent, then go to Lester, then Brooke, then Roger, if that's okay. Uh, how do you encourage someone who might know we have a new covenant, but they're feeling stuck in their operation in the Old Testament mindset? Uh, Kent, you want to go first, please? I think the first thing I would tell him to get rid of the idea of, of these many covenants and think of one covenant, everlasting covenant, but understand that there is an historical context to the covenants and there is an experiential context to the covenant. You, you can understand the historical idea. You know that there is the, the different covenant, different phases of the covenant, I like to think of it. But in each of those phases, there's the experience of the people who embrace the covenant and you and i could be you know you know we we know the covenant but we have different experience with the covenant so it's the experience you look at is that your experience should be the experience that embraces the covenant in the sense that you know and have your faith centered in the promises of the covenant and not in your feelings or your you know in your so Lots of us move from feeling to feeling where God is trying to say, your faith must be centered in the promises I make because those do not do not change. If it's centered just in your feeling today, I feel that God is with me because I feel that, you know, doing some good things. And then tomorrow I feel terrible. That's not what God wants you to understand when he talks about this covenant, this relationship with him. He wants you to know that it's constant. Because the promises are what you must base your faith in, Amen. not what you feel. Thanks, Kent. I appreciate that. Lester? Yeah, I, I'll tell them that it's, it's not about me because I can do nothing. I can't keep the Sabbath. I can't not commit adultery. But I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. And it's not me, and I quote again, not me, but Christ who lives in me. So the life which I live is Christ living in me. And that's the way I can keep the terms of the covenant. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lester. Brooke, and then Roger. I would tell them um, one thing I've had trouble with is like survival, like self, uh, giving up self and trusting God to provide and not always having to find the way to trust him. So if you can see it in the way that God has always been providing the way, you just thought it was you, but it's really been him. But if you give up that power, it'll change your life. Amen. Amen. That full surrender. Amen. Thank you. Absolutely. And I don't, I don't think I can add more wisdom than what has been shared. I, I recently was listening to a sermon with a pastor emphasize this aspect of God, that when God speaks to us, he speaks from the perspective of his all power and his infinite existence. And that's why he cannot lie. So when he tells me that I'm saved, he's not guessing that I'm saved. He's telling me that I'm saved because he's looked from now until eternity and he knows the end. And so me, I'm looking at, I can't, I wear glasses. I can't even see that far in front of me. So so if I'm viewing it from like only this thing and only as far as I can see, and God's like, no, I, I actually, I cannot lie. When I tell you that you are saved by grace, I'm not saying maybe you're saved by grace. I'm telling you, Roger, that you are saved by grace. And so um, there's nothing that grace can't cover. There's not a sin. There's not a mistake. There's not a habit. There's not uh, a hidden thing that nobody else knows about, but I know that grace cannot cover. There's nothing that the blood, when I claim that blood of Jesus, cannot wash. Amen. No matter how many times I go and ask, can you wash it again this time? Amen. 
Just go back and ask. Praise God, the blood does not run out. <laughs> Amen. Amen. It's been a blessing to discuss this lesson together. And may God help us to rest and rejoice in the new covenant. Let us pray together. Father, we thank you through Jesus. We are recipients of this covenant. Amen. Amen. Lord, we don't have it. We are not worthy. But because of you, we are part of the family. And Lord, you have drawn us to you more closely than a master-servant relationship. You have called us as brothers. You have called us as friends. And even as we have repeated again today, you have called us into this relationship of marriage with you. Help us, Lord, to surrender to you fully. Help us to know in you we can do all things. Help us to believe that your blood is able to save us from all sins. And the Lord in you, we can trust. It's not in our feelings, but in your promises, which are true. Thank you for hearing our prayer today. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. God bless you again.